I enjoyed the the ACL. I thought it was very just like easy flowing. Uh-huh. I agree with your knowledge. This week, the injury that you're going at is uh, the UCL, which for people that don't know, that is uh, Tommy John surgery. A lot of baseball players, specifically pitchers, have it. You were going at it hard, sharing a lot of statistics and pictures and whatnot. I don't, I don't want to lead you astray like uh, like last week where I'm just like, take it <laughs> what away, What do you Tom? think about Tommy John? Tom, wow. yes, take it away. Can you give us the origins of Tommy John, <laughs> what it means for the, for the, for the viewers? Uh-huh. Um, so... Now this one's different because with the ACL, you said you you know you had people that you rehabbed and right. one of them right to my right here that is Matthew right uh-huh. to my right, um, never rehabbed a UCL nope injury, um, but you have some thoughts and we we talked about it actually in depth in your office a couple of days ago about why you think it happens uh-huh. um, structurally. Uh-huh. So for the viewers or for the listeners, I feel like we have some some parents that may listen or anyone who could kind of find this useful for their their children and me someone who coaches junior high baseball and travel baseball which i think is you know um it's a good thing it could be a good thing but also you know depending on who the coaches are there, there's a lot of variables and i i think some of it that i've seen can kind of contribute to the wear and tear on you know a kid's shoulder elbow etc um so I just, for you, maybe give them some useful information or why it happens and, and, and what you think about it. Well, before you get into it, I got to ask yeah. you two questions. Uh-huh. One, is it something like like the ACL where you, you're like, oh, this is my project for however many months. Would you, like, look forward to it? Not forward to the kid, whoever did it, but to that process of rehabbing that, that type of injury? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You would? It, it, it is definitely one. I don't hope any of my kids tear right, UCL, absolutely. but um, I definitely would be fired up to uh, attack it. Something you've yeah. never yeah. done, how do right? I, how yeah. do I get it yeah. back to where I need it to be or better? You've done right. a couple ACLs. That's old news now. Right. Give me the UCL. Yeah, I'm, bo- <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm bored with that. And then uh, my second question is, uh, do you feel like it's a little bit more, I guess the word is, like controllable to not get that injury? Than the ACL, hundred oh, percent. Okay, hundred percent. If 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 you're a Tommy John, <clears throat> use, needing Tommy John to repair a UCL is not a, um, you know, just a, a you know, a, a crap luck um, injury. Okay, it is. It's mismanagement. It's okay. You know, um, lack of understanding overusing a kid okay and uh and definitely you know almost 100 as close as you can get to 100 percent preventable um your first question actually when you get the like to, to attack the um the rehab on it a lot of times when kids come in the training room they've already got posterior back shoulder pain right and sometimes inside elbow pain the inside the elbow that's where the ucl is that inside elbow pain isn't the naturally the ligament as much as it is spasming in the muscle that's serving to try to protect the ligament from being stressed okay so when they come in uh kids that have come in and stayed with me and gone through some of the uh, rehab and, and intervention is basically what you would be doing should they have had Tommy John okay. and coming out, you know, later stages in their rehab. So you're kind of rehabbing the same lines you would if it were Tommy John, right? Without the surgery, so they would. Uh, you know, the one thing that you may hear a lot is. After, you know, especially obviously in major leaguers, they get the, they blow out their UCL, they get Tommy John, they come back throwing five to eight miles per hour harder. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. baseball enthusiasts think, wow, if, if so-and-so, Matt Tanner, could throw eight miles an hour more after surgery than he, he did, I should go blow out my elbow. I should just get the surgery. I'm better right, off just getting the right. surgery. Right, it's the surgery that did it. Right. It's actually the rehab, naturally, 
that strengthen your arm that much got more. you yeah fix all your problems that contributed like you were saying hoop oh, okay. <laughs> to the, in, the initial injury so just like the the acl mm-hmm. um but again the acl you can't we could take you through that preventative program right and still can't guarantee you you're not going to tear that thing right i'm much more confident that if you follow the the program the tommy right way. john post-surgical rehab Far before your injury were even to come up, or you started to get shoulder or elbow soreness, right? Not only are you going to prevent the injury, I'll give you the five to eight miles per hour on your fastball. What um, what like for me? I use my my patella uh, yeah, my patella, patella tendon, tendon for my ACL. <clears throat> what are they using for your UCL? Like what? It's uh, it's called your palmaris longus tendon. Okay. So if you uh, – some people, it's actually absent in a lot of people. But if you touch your uh, like your thumb to your pinky with the, the tendon that pops up prominently in your face right there, yep, that's your uh, palmaris longus. <clears throat> They'll take that as your graft. You don't need that. No. And actually, fun fact here, if it were on the – what's – uh. On the side of a Cheerios or a cereal <laughs> box for you, right? This or is under, it, a is Snapple, Snapple cap, cap there right? You go. Or if this is like a Jeopardy question, something like that, you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure the percentage, but there are a lot of people that don't have oh, really? Palmaris longus tendon. <laughs> yeah. In, in, in fact, I have, I could go there. My right hand, I don't have it. My, le- my left, I do. <clears throat> so that's the, that's the common tendon that's so used pe- to right, graft the UCL. What if you're starting to lose that, like genetically, like it's getting wiped out of people? So what are they going to use if yeah, you what don't if, have? If you don't have two of them, like you don't have one, what if you don't have either? Well, in either hand, what do either? they use? You could go back, you could go cadaver. Okay. You oh, can okay. use you can use other tendons, oh, okay. but the, the reason that's so popular because is because it's, so it's because it's absent, right? There's no real okay. uh, significance to it. You wouldn't, under, <clears throat> you wouldn't appreciate any type of loss of function having taken that away from you and used right. it to your UCL. And would it, so it would be the same premise as the ACL, like it would die at some point, right? It would right. change over. Yep. So you, yep, would, yep. yep. You're gonna have that, uh, um, that, like you said, the dying and then regeneration of the uh, properties of taking that tendon to a ligament. So here's uh, here's my question, right? Like. In your perspective, without ever actually rehabbing one, but you know enough, and I'm I'm sure you, I mean, obviously you, you're getting um, pictures and things like that about, like, the major league players that played in the Little League World Series tearing their UCL and, and things like that. Is it, do you think it's like a lack of some sort of function in the body? Like, what what do you think is the easiest way or the most preventable fix, right? Because you're talking about the rehab for it and and things like that. But, like, what do you think um, the easiest way to to prevent it? Like, if you had to pick the the biggest thing that a kid out there or a parent could have their kids start doing that's, like, 12, 13, 14 years old to prevent potentially doing that, like, what would it be? Scapular stabilization. So what that means is your your shoulder blade and your positioning of your shoulder blade on your your back. So... um, your shoulder blade is is basically free floating right there's no there's no ligament minimal ligament uh bone to bone attachment it's more all uh surrounded by tendons and muscles right mm-hmm. so number 1 to that is posture we and and what i think is you know what's contributing more to it as we get as we evolve is we're becoming more and more sedentary, more and more lazy. You know, our our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents grew up and were either an agricultural or industrial uh, society where they're out working in the coal mine, the farm. You know, they're uh, standing up. <clears throat> you're right, an assembly line. Or, yeah, we're now the American dream is to have the corner office, sit at your desk eight hours, and uh, and have crap posture. Uh, the kids are. Less kids are out playing, playing video games. Yeah, they're playing video <clears> games <throat> and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and so the postural part of just being slouched, rounded shoulders, uh, hunched over, that in itself is already a major, major problem that has to be addressed, and that never does. Um, you know, naturally, the the biggest pet peeve I have is 
immediately they go out and you know they they'll get they'll get muscle soreness in the shoulder chalk it up as rotator cuff pain and and, and most of the time it is and we'll throw therabands at them do all these cute nifty th theraband exercises and you're getting nothing accomplished um the the big thing with that is essentially y you could get into shoulder um instability and all that kind of stuff which also would kind of be on the same rehab principle and philosophy but you your shoulder uh is essentially a golf tee right for all of us sport-minded people a golf tee with a softball sitting on top of the golf uh the golf tee odds are that thing's falling off the golf tee right right so it's going to be the rotator cuff that has to keep that softball on the golf tee and the theraband is equivalent to we're just going to keep picking the ball up off the ground and balancing it on the the t right never addressing the t the t is the shoulder blade so at some point sunday if we can't tee our ball up right you might the ball falls off you put it back on once or twice <laughs> after that you take the tee out of the ground and you find a more stable place to put the tee in in order to put that ball on it, right? Right. So the scapular stabilization goes back to that just finding new ground and creating a stable base for the shoulder to operate on. If that's not happening, you're losing uh, efficiency, you're losing mechanics to the shoulder. So then you're compensating? <laughs> you're compensating because what your body – and you as an athlete are going to say is if I could hit 95 on the radar gun, I'm doing it one way or the other. My body's going to find a way for me to throw this ball as hard as I can to the catcher's I'm, mitt. I'm hitting 95. Right. So now you compensate, and most of the time what you do when it comes down to Tommy John is if you're having a shoulder issue and you have a scapular issue, which everybody does, <clears throat> you and I have it, right. not throwing the, a baseball regularly, right? You end up uh, basically changing the slot of your uh, of your, of arm. your arm, so right? And you kind you basically straighten out instead of being almost in a ninety ninety position <clears throat> and delivering to the plate. Right. You're gonna you're gonna uh, extend that arm out and create a whip effect. So you're from a physics standpoint, you're increasing your right. the radius. Right. Right. And you're getting that more of a whip, being able to get to hit 95 because you can't do it from a strength component so now when you're whipping you're starting to create a lot of tension a force on the inside of that elbow right <clears throat> so the next phase of that after your shoulder pain you're going to start getting elbow pain because as you keep doing that and creating that force on the elbow your muscles on the inside of that elbow go into spasm that's what that initial pain is and that's what that initial pain is that the kid's going to come into the training room to me and say, you know, I've got a problem here. Right. Um, at that point, once that muscle's in spasm because it's not there, it's not made to tolerate that type of force from a whipping standpoint with your right. with your arm. So it's going to it's going to tighten up and spasm because it's overused at some point. The only the next spot for um, uh, any muscle in any type of spasm, if you continue to put pressure on it, the last resort is it gives up and it releases the spasm. Right. Right. Part of that is how you treat spasms. But if this spasm now breaks up because it's finally said, listen, I'm waving my white flag. I can't keep doing this anymore. It's now going to say, I'm taking a back seat. The UCL, it's all you, man. Gone. Yeah, that's not lasting long. Wow. And now it's torn. So is my question was: Is the spasm a kind of their, your body's way of telling you, like, hey, yes, we got to stop doing this. This is a problem. Hundred percent. And I could, I remember going back. I, I was talking to Hoop earlier this week when we were talking about it in the training room. <clears throat> our, uh, our guy Adam Sosnowski. I remember vividly. Adam had came in same type of thing. Every time he was throwing, he had uh, inner elbow pain. Um, and it, it was chalked up to that type of spasming. Right. Not to say that Adam was ready to blow out his UCL, but right. you know sometimes, and again that that part once you get to that point, it could be 
you know, you're 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 on the roulette wheel a little bit. You don't know right. if it's now or now or later when it's going to happen. Um, but I was able to take Adam and get him into the weight room. Just have him throw a tennis ball. Don't give him any, you know, give him no teaching cue whatsoever. Throw a tennis ball as hard as you can at the wall. You have pain? Yeah. Okay, here's what I want you to do. And the first fix was just to figure out kind of diagnostically what was going on with them. Okay, I want you to pinch your shoulder blades and really get get in a good posture and almost overemphasize that. Hold that shoulder blade through your pitching windup and keep it pinched as long as you can, right. which is now changing the entire dynamic and mechanics of your slot, shoulder. The slot right. Your shoulder's at now. Right. Because if you're pinched back that way, you really can't get out and extend and, and create efficient. that whip. Right. right. You're going to be in a better position 90-90. And him holding that eliminated his elbow pain immediately. So I knew right then and there that how I was going to treat him was we're going we're gonna to make his elbow feel better, you know, with the, your, your TLC-type treatments of stem ice. Right massage, ultrasound, that kind of stuff. Get that spasm out of there. So he doesn't have any more pain. Right. But the bigger thing is, long-term issue is we've got to fix his upper back and get him in that position. So to get him through the rest of that high school season, it was really just overemphasizing. But when you're you're starting to get tired, it's because you're not pinching those shoulder blades anymore. You're back into the poor posture, rounded and now shoulders. You're putting all that pressure back onto your elbow, which is correct. Right, right, right. Hmm. Yeah, and those are like something like that. So you start to get tired. You like you'd probably notice it, but like things that you don't notice, like okay, arm slot changes, ball comes a little away from the body mm-hmm. as you start to get tired. To an untrained eye or to someone who's not really paying, like you're not going to notice it. But then when they yeah. start complaining about the about the elbow, yep. Um, we actually have a a player like currently. Obviously, we'll leave him unnamed, but yeah. you know, for as as long as he's played, like ball real far away from his body, right? Throws it like just the mechanics just aren't there. I never knew why. Um, now I do, but he made the passing comment to me. He hasn't been able to throw. Made the passing comment to me yesterday. Like, okay. Well, I'm holding the ball up like closer, 90-90 position. Well, it doesn't bother me as much, right? That's what he's working on in physical therapy and, and things like that. And it's like, well, yeah, like when the ball is farther away from your body, like you said, it's going to be a whip. It's just, I mean, it's just going to be a lot of tension going through that elbow joint. Yeah, and 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 on a side note, since it's all unnamed, if anybody out there tells you to not retract your shoulder <laughs> blades, you should stop uh, seeing that person. They should have their their license taken away from them and or at least stop practicing and trying to take care of people's shoulders and elbows. Yeah. But that's a just a different little disclaimer. So you kind of hit on um prevention. Yeah. So is it more like we you know like for most little leagues or all little leagues it's a pitch count. Mhm. And then also like prevention wise like physically like what muscles should I be working like if I want to be a pitcher <clears throat> I do not want UCL surgery. What what kind of like workout should I be doing? Core. Okay. A lot of core strengthening. Wow. And that's where uh, you start with core. Yep. A lot of core strengthening and then back to that scapular stabilization. They're your two main points that you have to drive home uh to attack the body and prevent it from uh um, core because of the rotation that you're trying to get? Or like the so the, the torque, I guess I want one of our favorite our favorite sport um, media mogul here in the in the high school athletic world that's not really media um, had a had a local <laughs> had a local uh, oh uh, my God. P- uh, baseball pitcher um, pictured. I showed Hooper the picture, shared it with him, um, and it was the perfect example of what's going wrong at the at the lower level. And the core to help to contribute to the top. That's creating all the stress at the shoulder and then down at the elbow. <clears throat> Go back to the ACL because they're they're actually a little bit related. We talked about the ACL and that knee goes inside, right. right, and caves in. Same thing with a pitcher. Once you cave that in, 
right? Right. You're not a, you're not able because your knee is not balanced up over your uh, your ankle when you're driving off the pitching mound, right? So, luck. Hopefully, for a right-handed pitcher, I'm hoping that I'm in the third base dugout as the athletic trainer. Okay. Right. I don't know anything. I'm not a pitch coach. I'm not going to pretend I am. So there's a lot of you know, if you get a good athletic trainer and a good pitching coach, that's a deadly combination to take care of shoulder elbow health right okay but i don't have that pitching i'm not a baseball guy right um but i know biomechanically certain things i'm looking for right so if i'm in that third base dugout and i have a right-handed pitcher that's perfect because in the stretch or coming in and wind up everything straight to you yeah i'm seeing his chest Right. right so i can see that knee that is pushing off the mound as he's delivering to the plate He's got to come up and be balanced on that, keep that knee over his ankle <clears throat> as he accelerates and pushes off the mound. Right. Right. If you get what you're looking for is that caving. If you see the caving of the knee and then he goes, right, yeah. that caving in the knee just took away anything he's getting from the core on up right. to throw 95. Okay. So now he lost all of his lower half, right, and all the power in his legs right. to be able to go. So now what's he going to do? He's going to get that arm out because he lost that. He, his only goal is I'm throwing 95, I'm getting it there somehow. Somehow, some way. Right. So now that that's gone, that's going to create the same type of thing he was talking about last uh, last week with the deadlift and stuff where you get round, uh, hunched over at the the spine and all that kind of right. stuff. <clears throat> that that cycle is occurring right up the up the body, which once you get to that point – we didn't obviously go this to this extent because it didn't affect the shoulder. Right. But once you get that arching in that upper back, that means your shoulder blades are around and not retracted in that position. Right. Now your shoulder's in a very unstable position. Um, and then now you're what we just talked about earlier, getting into the why it's elbow pain. So that's the first thing I'm looking for is that knee caving. Right. If that knee's caving, I know that kid's on <clears throat> forget the pitch count. We got to figure this out because he's already he's fatigued there. Right. And then the next thing would be, and it's harder to see from the dugout, but is call he retracted? Skip. Call the skip. Get, yeah. get somebody warmed up. Yeah. So I mean, you got to follow pitch counts because you know they're not arbitrary. They're not um, up for discussion. Like, yeah. This like, is, but, and again, which, and and there's wiggle room. Like it's yeah, a yeah. it's a guideline. It's a it's a guidance. So there are going to be kids that can't get the 75 pitches in a day. He can only throw 45. Right. But there are going to be some kids that can throw 90 and they can tolerate it, and they'll never have a problem. Right. But, there, but to say that a 75-pitch count is just, you know, it, researchers didn't That's, throw a dart at the dartboard and go, you know what? That's at that age, age range, we're going 75 for That's a day. That's a good number. So we should th- it's based that. on a lot of data on shoulder fatigue. So I'm going to say this. So a pitch count. It's going to, in the long run, help more kids, save more kids, and it's going to hold back because you're going to have yes. maybe one out of every five kids who can go past the you know 100-pitch right. high school limit, but right. those other four can't, shouldn't. Correct. You, we, you talked about, you mentioned in our conversation during the week, Nolan Ryan was able mm-hmm. to go out and throw 120 pitches, right? Yeah, but, he, again, but again, like three just days like rest, the yeah. ACL with uh, Adrian Peterson. Peterson, Nolan Ryan's a freak. You can't compare yeah, to Nolan Ryan. Right. Like, his ability, like, he could withstand. No, no, I'm saying, yeah, but people will point to Nolan Ryan. Like, oh, he used yeah. to pitch every three days. You know, he would throw, you know, 150 pitches a game. Yeah, but Get they, it. You could point to to one. But there are plenty of people that are currently in the majors that have blown out their UCL and probably a bunch of guys throughout the, the country and, you know, every other country that have blown out that you've never heard of. Yeah, there, <laughs> there are a lot of kids between 14 and 16 in this country blowing out UCLs that have no business doing it. Mm. None. And mm-hmm. and uh you know and, and these surgeries are completely preventable because it's just mismanagement. And now I mean and now you're you're playing more baseball. Like even ten years ago, fifteen years ago, it was you know, okay, I'm nine years old, ten years old, I'm playing elephant little league, elephant pitch right. like coach pitch. Like that's it. Now it's Okay, I'm playing that league, and then you know there's a little league, and then there's a junior teener teener league, which is like the same. So I'm playing games every day, and 
okay, Matt might be the coach of my little league team. Tom's coach of my junior team. They're not talking. They don't care. Matt cares about winning. Tom cares about winning, which in my eyes is part of the problem because if you're the coach of that team, yeah, you want to win, right? I'm the yeah. most, I'm one of the most competitive people you'll meet, but I'm not going to sacrifice winning at the detriment right. of a kid, or even if it could potentially be the detriment right. of a, of a kid, you know what I mean? And, and, and the problem is, and, and that's where, you know, somebody like you in mm-hmm. the position you're in, Matt, yourself, right? You guys don't have a dog in the fight. Yeah. Right. So that allows you to be a little bit more objective, take a step back and right. say, what's, what is this really in the best interest of this kid? Right. You know, and, and that's not what's happening at the youth level. No. And the youth, the youth sports, it, it's become a, a billion dollar business. Yeah. Youth right. sports. Like we, we used to go grow up, th- jump on our bikes, track down people at their houses, go play, go play organize a, either a wiffle ball game, hardball game at a local park pick teams no no parent around right you know nobody telling you what to do and how to how, do how it and you know keep your arm this. up you're yeah. di- you know you're swinging you're di- we just played mm-hmm. and then the street lights by the time the street lights came home or you're starving to death you went home and that was the end of it now everything's everything's structured for the kid because it's driven on this billion dollar business that has become youth sports right and a very wise person told me and it, you know, it didn't really click um, before until this was people People are going to spend exorbitant amounts of money on two things, their kids and their pets. And when you look at it, it's 100% true, mm-hmm. right? I have a cat in the house. I'm deathly allergic to the damn thing, <laughs> right? My <laughs> wife loves the cat. My kids love the cat, oh right? When the cat gets fleas, I want to kick it out into the woods, right? What do I do instead? You go we'll pay two hundred. I pay two hundred bucks to the vet and smile. Yeah. You know, like so. It's the same thing. You do anything you could for your kids, but the problem is when it's mom and dad. Very rarely, most in most situations, the blinders are on. You can't step back and look objectively and say, yeah. you know, the buddy. We got to get to this trainer. We got to get to this uh, right. hitting lesson and this pitching lesson. And you know, now we got travel league, and now we're got you know we're gonna play town ball, and now we're gonna, um, you know, I, it blew my mind a couple of years ago that you know one of these different you know we got a lot of travel uh, programs going on. There's like six U T ball travel. Like, yeah. oh yeah, what oh, are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, show up, give the kid a hat mm-hmm. and a shirt. Throw them a couple French fries, put the ball on the tee, hit it, and let them run around for an hour and go home. What are you talking about practicing tee ball He's going to the and league. traveling? What are you talking yeah. about? My son's going to the league. And that, right. honestly, is so much. That's going. why it's a billion-dollar yeah. business. Yeah. And, and there's it's, far too many people taking advantage of that and it's someone to line who, their pockets. Some, someone who's in it, that is exactly what it is. Oh, like yeah, They correct. won't say it, but every parent thinks, like, my kid is – you know, bees need he's 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 going to the lead. Oh, if I get the trainer, if I do the best slice bread, and 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 as a you know as a parent, like yeah, you're gonna spend the money and whatever you're gonna do it because it's for your kid. I'm get telling that. you, you can't separate it. I I'm sitting here and I'm telling you that objectively. I've watched it. I have I have Madison. Um, you know, I tell her all the time with basketball. I'm not gonna bust your chops. I see too many people, too many kids, that are sometimes playing in our athletic programs that are going. I don't want to be here. Yeah. That's why they're coming in my room. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, they're yeah, looking yeah, yeah. for me as they escape out. Like, yo, my ankle's hurting me today. Like, yeah. I can't run. Mm-hmm. You know, or I can't throw today because they're tired. They don't want to do this anymore, right? Yeah, right. So uh, the same thing. She 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 talks. My wife put her in t- uh, softball when she was little. She didn't like it. She pulled out. Now, all of a sudden, she's like, eh, you know, I w-, she said the, made the comment, I wish you made me play softball. No. Me as dad, I want to hear that rather than why did you make me do this? Right. I don't want, I'm not going to be that father. So even then, I'm sitting here and I got that and I grasped that and I've done that with my kids. N- Natalie hits me last week, week, week and a half ago. She's running track. I'm a pole vaulter now. I'm, I'm like, you're what? You're, you're pole vaulting, 
right? You're 85 pounds, something like that, right? <laughs> How the heck are you even being able to bend a bar to go over and vault over six foot, you know? And six foot's the minimum. Right. She, she cleared it yesterday in a meet against Scranton, and here I am, like, I'm taking her to Allentown, the vertical assault. We're getting lessons, you know. Like, I'm, Shout I'm out. already clouded. Shout out Dave Krajewski. Dave Krajewski, right. Vertical assault. Yeah, you know, and, uh, but I'm fired up about it, you know. It, it's something she's excited. It gets me excited. And right. I'm sitting here. I went into dad mode, like, I'm going to get you. This could be a scholarship. This could be money for – because, again, you, that's the athletic director part of me is saying she's a female that – how many female pole vaulters are out there in Division, division three schools? They could throw you some money for that, like mm. girls lacrosse or girls tennis. Like right. You could get that stuff. But Girls golf. Right. You know, so you, from the whole Title IX component, you could take advantage of that being a data of, of girls that are athletes. But, but right then and there, I'm clouded, and I got I to gotta step back and say, hold on a minute. She cleared six foot. Easy. If she likes it. Yeah, if she wants it, again, just like Madison, if she comes to me like, That's Dad, I'm thing, a pole right vaulter. There. I want to, I want to get, I want next year as a senior to try to clear ten feet. I will drive you down and we'll get lessons. Right. But I'm not gonna sit there and go, let's go another one, vault another one. No, I'm gonna let her go to somebody that knows what they're doing, could be objective with my daughter, and come back and say, Dad, kind of, you know. We got a couple lessons through. Maybe it's not worth it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, she's not a pole vaulter. All right, man, no problem. I appreciate it. You know, that was the not like, thing no, no, like no, I'll, I'll show you. She'll get over that bar, you know? Yeah. Right. But that was, like, the biggest thing for me growing up personally. Like, like my parents never pushed me to do anything I didn't want to, but if I was going to do something, I was going to do it at 100%. And then as I got older, I was like, you know what? Baseball's a little too slow for me. Can I do AAU? Uh -huh. Parents, absolutely. Yeah. Like, they gave me everything I wanted, but it was more like me being the guy to go up to him and be like, hey, I want to do AAU or I want to play. It, it has football. to be self-driven. If yeah, not, absolutely. It's, it, it, it's gone. And I think and that's the problem, like where you were saying with a lot of these kids, is like mom and dad are trying to live vicariously through these children. Like, right. I didn't get to do this, this, or this. But if I put you through this, this, or this, you might have opportunities that I didn't have. Yeah. Yeah. Or see, they didn't succeed how they wanted to. And, I mean, I don't – you probably see it like, okay, so, Matt, you're – basketball coach my coach baseball basketball you probably I, I feel like i don't see it as much on the high school like school level with that so you see it but like travel it's just right, right there in right. your face right. like it's just there and you, you see the kid and you're like uh you know this kid would probably be very very good just like it would do him a world of good just playing local town ball league no parents paying the money like that's going to get my kid there and it's almost like you see it and it's like well no they're doing it for themselves and as soon as they graduate they never pick up a basketball again, yeah they're doing it for them you know what i mean and that's and that goes back i've said it and i've shared this story because when i was at a conference and heard it it absolutely blew me away and since i've known this bit of information i've watched and it's a hundred percent true i know i haven't shared it on here so i'll certainly leave it here with it but Parents always say, when do, I, when do I start, when do I put little Matt in basketball? When do I start him in youth football? When do I start him in little league baseball? When do I start strength training, you know, running track, whatever it is, right? When do I start? What's, what's the key to success to get them that scholarship and those professional athlete aspirations? This guy turns around and says, no problem. You tell me when you as mom and dad – are comfortable with young Steven coming home and saying, Dad, I'm done with football. Dad, it's time to hang up the baseball cleats. What, at what age do you want to hear that come from your son or daughter? Right? So, of course, that, that you take a step back and go, whoa, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Right? Why are they saying this? I thought they loved it. Yeah. So what he got, the point is, you got 10 years. So if, you're, if you want that to be – through college, right? I want him to be a college athlete. You're 22, 23 years old. You better start your kid at 13 then. They're only going to play one sport for 10 years. They're going to get exhausted. They're tired of it. They're moving on with their life. And so when you throw your kid in 5U T-ball, <laughs> right, at 5 years old, 
you better be ready at round time 15 when it comes for junior high baseball tryouts or high school baseball tryouts. That kid's cashing out, and you better be okay with it because it's not the kid's fault. Right. He's played baseball for 10 years. (laughs) He's done. It's over. He's exhausted. And I'll never forget we had a a track kid come up to – uh, I think he was maybe a junior in high school. That This was the first time it hit me, like, clinically or practically, right, uh, at work. After I heard this, kid quit track, right? Dad stops me in the parking lot the one day. He says, you know, we had a good relationship. Yo, you got to talk to my boy. You got to talk to my boy. We got to get him back to track. He won't run track. He doesn't want to run track. I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him, see what's going on. I don't you know. Love to have him around. Great kid. You know, it helps, it helps with the team and stuff. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I've had him, I've been having him run. He's been running with me since he's four years old. Whoa. Mm. I didn't share the information I had with dad, but hit me square in the face. There it is. Time's up, man. That That's what it came down to. So you think I had the conversation with the kid? No, because I know why the kids quit track. Right. He's done. He doesn't want to run anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, I just want to go back because I didn't want to. I didn't want to interrupt you. I didn't want to get docked on my report <laughs> report card. <laughs> uh, Runko report nah, card you just radar. Gotta, you gotta be yourself. But you were t- you were talking uh, a little bit ago about like your kid. Like you said it with uh, Matt. You said it with your parents. Like I'm done with baseball. I want to go do AAU. Like you're looking for. Well, my mom was a little excited when I was done with baseball yeah. too. She was kind of like. Thank God. Like, she, she's not a fan of sitting there waiting for things to happen. So she's, I mean, it, it was kind of like a win-win for her. Right. But it was more of me pushing and being like, hey, I think basketball is more my thing. I want to I wanna get after this. And mm-hmm. like, they were more head over heels. We'll give you AAU personal. Like, they would do that for me, and that mm-hmm. was awesome. But, that, yeah, so that's that's the big thing with me. Obviously, uh, don't don't have a kid, but, like, you know those that you ju- know of. Th- yeah, those ju- those junior high. Those me, me, I have like six running around. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Like those junior high kids. Like at at that point, like okay, like parents are entrusting me with you know to 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 give their kid like something that they could take you know through for the rest of their life. So not just well, a sport, like you yeah. said, life. Like you're trying to teach them some life lessons through that sport. With me, like I got. Into baseball because, you know, Crop hired me because he knew I was into the, the strength and conditioning aspect of it, right? That, you know, mm-hmm. that That's how I ended up on the staff. So with me, like, that is my job for the varsity program. So as soon as the season ends, I give it, like, two weeks. Hey, you know, reach out to me. Like, I'm not going to chase you. Right. You want to come. You want to get better. And and I say it in uh, side note, the biggest thing the the lowest hanging fruit to to become a better athlete is strength and conditioning mm-hmm. right it's not more of your sport it's oh you don't you don't ever see the weight room oh strength and conditioning you'll get incrementally better whereas specifically you might get a little better right but if you have a better body you'll get incrementally better mm-hmm. but back to the point like i don't chase any of them i go you reach out to me here's my number y'all have it you can reach out to coach crope if you don't have it get it Reach out to me, hey, Coach Hoop, so-and-so, I would really like to start, you know, weightlifting. Okay, that's the first thing. You don't do that. I'm not chasing you. I don't care, mm-hmm. right? It's not about me. I'm not that guy. But if you tell me that you want to be there, okay, that's the first thing. Right. So now you want to be there. Okay, I'll work around. You You have work? Okay, we'll figure it out. We'll make sure you're in there two or three days a week. Like, I will do that. You want to you wanna do this? You want to get in the weight room? You want to get better? I will make myself available. I'll figure it out so you get in there at least two, maybe three times a week. No problem. In the course of that, if you tell me, like, oh, I want to, you're a freshman, you, you know, you, maybe you pinch hit a couple of times as a freshman, I, I want to be a starter. Okay, you told me that piece, of, that, that's your goal. So now I'm going to be a little harder on you. Like, oh, you know, I just, I'm a little tired today. Like, oh, I, you know, I played, you know, a Legion game. Well, no, get your ass, like, oh, you get your ass here. Like, you said you want to be a starter. Mm-hmm. Like you're not you're not beat down. Like oh you played you played a, a legion game. It's fine. Get get your ass here. Mm-hmm. So as the kids start giving me like those pieces of information, I want to be a starter. You know I want to play baseball in college. Like that'll determine how much I'll chase them or how hard I'll be on them when it comes to that stuff. But again, it all comes back to the first thing is you need to send me a text. You need to give me a call. Hey, I want to start. 
And then from there, I mean, depending on the kid, yeah, it'll change. Like some kids I'll be a little tougher on. Some kids I won't, depending on what they tell me over the course. But I'm not going to chase you. I'm not going to make you do anything. Like it's not, oh, you're coming to the weight room so I could check the box that we did it. Right. Because if you're there physically but not mentally, you don't want to be there. Like you're, I'm not going Absolutely. to get you to do what you need to do. Same thing with any sport. Like if you don't want to be playing basketball and you're there because, oh, your parents are forcing you or, oh, like – I'm I'm not going to be able to get the most out of you. Right. You know they're, what I mean? They're, they're checking out. And that, and that's something I share. I, I try to press upon, you know, I have student trainers all the time at the school, is whenever you're even, you go back to an injury and you're looking at an injury, the, you know, our, our guy Runko being the nurse that he is, he understands the importance of history taking, you mm-hmm. know, and that, and that you, you can know, you know exactly what's going on before you even put your hand on the, on the patient's uh, body, you know, or whatever's going on through that if you're taking a good history well the history that kid is telling you a story about their injury their body's telling you another story it's my job to make sure that both stories line up if both stories don't line up we've got an issue here going on you're either you're either the the tough guy you know no 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 i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine your body's not telling me you're fine your ankle's not saying you're good your knee's not telling me you're good you're trying to tell me it I don't care what you say right now. But then there's that other kid that goes, nah, this isn't, this isn't good. This isn't good. I can't do this. I can't do that. Your body's telling me it's okay. I'm not going to tell you, hey, get your rear end back out on the track or back up on the baseball field right. and get going because I know there's something going on there that's not adding up. And the thing that excited me about getting back um, into the high school, not getting in back, but progressing to the high school – having come out of, you know, a Division One education and that where I thought I was wanted to go professionally was I got to come back, I've got that experience that I had, and, you know, and it worked worked out my favor not too long into my career. I had, I was over at West, I had Sean, I had Matt McGloin, I had Hubie and Shrive and those guys where it was a perfect blend of here's my Division One guys, right? Real, real, I'm treating you guys. Real quick, where's You're not getting any sympathy out of me but you want to be the man and you're the guy on our team you oh my wrist is bothering me Uh uh-uh let's go you're on the field because guess what when you sign that letter of intent at nebraska penn state syracuse alabama wherever you may be going as a freshman they don't care that you don't feel well that day you're practicing Mm -hmm. you got a scholarship you're practicing they don't want to hear it you're just another body on a roster because you could easily pack your bags. They're going to find another recruit, right? So I'm going to treat those guys a heck of a lot differently than I have the kid that is a very solid high school football player, high school baseball player. But I know, you know, maybe go to play Division three. Maybe once, once the kid is finished with high school, he's finished. But while he's here, he's that kid that, Listen, you do what you got to do. I got to play. <laughs> you got it, bud. Let's go, right? I'll do whatever. Like you said, I'll spend hours in the training room. I'll figure out a tape job. I'll figure something out. I'll get you to play right. without without hurting you, being able to step back and objectively say, you know, I'm putting this kid at jeopardy. But then there's the kid in high school we all know, just happy to be on a team. You know, might not ever see the field. Some of them don't want to see the field. They just want to want to wear their jacket. They want to get that hoodie. They want to get the travel gear. They want to they want to go to the pasta party. When that kid has an ankle injury, I ain't treating him like I'm treating the kid that thinks he's going to chase a Division One scholarship. Right. You know what, bud? Grab some ice. We'll wrap it up. Call it a day. Take today off. Call it a day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll keep an eye on this thing. You know, we'll, I'm not going to push that kid. But the, and that's to me the most fun part of it is. I'm going to attack that those different demographics differently and when it comes down to it develop a relationship with a kid regardless of what they're going to do that turns into listen you need something find me when you're 30 years old Oops. you know stop by and say hello you know same, that same same thing with coaching right i mean it, it's literally the same thing like the kid who's playing travel baseball all summer and paying and like 
will do whatever you want. Like, wait, well, like, yep, I'll take, you know, extra swings in their basement. Like, yeah, that kid's going to get treated different than the kid who, like you said, shows up to practice, wants to be on the team. Not treated differently, but, like, you the know. different goals. It, it, it's different goals. Like, I'm not going to, like, I want that kid to enjoy baseball. I want them both to enjoy baseball, basketball, whatever it is. But, like, I know I can yell at that kid, and I can get tough with that kid who – is like die hard, like, yep, I'm here. I want to be, you know, freshman varsity starter. I play travel baseball. Like, this is it. Like, I want to play baseball in college. I suppose the kid that just wants to be there. Like, I want them both on the team because they're just as important, mm -hmm. right? You mm -hmm. need those good team guys that are, like, selfless, there for the team, cheer, and you need the guys that are going to do it on the field. Yeah. So I want both of them around, and you need to figure out how to keep both of them around. I need to challenge that kid who wants to play baseball in college, basketball in college. Like, you need to challenge him. You need to challenge the other kid, but it just in a different way. Like, I want you to be as good as you can be with the two hours I know that we're going to spend, you know, a day together for three months out of the year or two months out of the year. I want to get you as good as you want to be. But sometimes I'm going to know when you're feeling it, when you're not feeling it. Like, I'm not going to yell at you. I'm going to yell at this kid. I'm not going to yell at you the same way. So, I'm going to get on you. So my question to